Hello. Again, I welcome to all of the audience and respected professors. The present academic session is going to preside by Professor N. N. Chakravarti sir. Yes, sir. And we have to renowned speaker, Professor Sekala M. Naya. Please have your seat on the dais. And the next speaker, Professor Jadeshwar Ghosh. Please have your seat on the dais. Yes, yes. yes. Now I would like to introduce the chairpersons. I think no need to introduce already introduced just before this. As we know that he's very renowned professor and former ICP member secretary of ICPR. Now, our renowned speaker, Professor Sikala M. Nayar, as we know, he was the director and international school of the Sri Sankar Studies and professor and head department of philosophy, Sri Sankaracharya University of Sanskrit Kaladi, and former professor, Nalanda University, joint secretary, Indian Philosophical Congress. She has written several articles in very reputed. Indian, sorry, international and national journals. So, ma'am, I welcome you. And now I can also introduce the next speaker, Jadeshwar Ghosh. As you know, that Jadeshwar Ghosh sir, is the professor of philosophy, Department of Philosophy, Vidya Sagar University, and West Bengal. And very recent. Uh, very recently published a very famous book that is called From the Gym to Meaning Holy Gym, a study from Bertha Ruiz, Wigenstein and Quine, published by ICFR in 2022. And he's a renowned professor. He has published other several books as well as some important articles in national and international journals. So it is a time to start our program so i can invite our speaker first speaker professor sitram nanaya Forget. I'm extremely sorry. I apologize for because I want to felicitate the, all the uh, <laughs> respected delegates on the dais. Firstly, I can request to uh, Santika to felicitate so Santika to bring the uh, things, and I can invite uh, uh, Professor Jay Singh Sir to felicitate our respected uh, chairperson and N. Chakravarti Wait. With momento. Secondly, I can request Moniki Basan Ma'am to felicitate uh, Professor uh, Srikala M. Nayar with Shell and Garland. Moniki, sorry, Moniki Basan Ma'am. 
What is the same, ma'am? Yes. With Salon Garland to Professor Shikla M. Nayar. And now I can request to Godavan Sumistra Sar to felicitate Jadasurkar Sarit Garland and Sal. With Sal, with Sal. Thank you all. Again, I welcome to all of you. I'm so sorry for this. Let us start. Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. Thank you very much, uh, Rajiva. Actually, it's a very bad idea to line up behind the stalwarts. I was just telling Professor uh, Nirmalia, uh, my good friend, both Professor Pradhan and Professor Nirmalia have exhausted all that has to be said on both Quine and uh, uh, Bhartri Hari. So let me see uh, how I can refresh uh, you on uh, both these uh, uh, thinkers. Friends, before I step into this uh, huge exercise, uh, uh, let me bring on to the niceties. Can you put it on the slideshow? Slideshow, please. On the benefits of cross cultural uh, uh, studies. See, we quickly engage in cross cultural studies without any warning or without being uh, aware of the grave task that we are undertaking. Actually, we should take into account the cultural disparities. Professor Anand Vaidya was with us online yesterday, uh, but today I don't see him. So he has written voluminously on the cross-cultural uh, studies. For instance, when we speak about jnana, it is not, not just knowledge that uh, uh, the Western community uh, speak uh, about. Never mind, it's okay. It is not okay, but never mind. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, so. Uh, I'm trying to uh, bring before you uh, uh, the, I mean, the little caution that probably we need to uh, take to account uh, when we juxtapose two thinkers or two systems or two thoughts uh, which arise from two different uh, positions. But nevertheless, this uh, dual task is worth undertaking. La in the last IPC, I was just wondering, like, you know, when we go far ahead, Juxtaposing Quine with Bhartri Hari, how much the West come towards us is a question that we need to address. Uh, but nevertheless, that doesn't mean that we Indians should stop uh, uh, juxtaposing uh, our uh, thinkers uh, from the West, not because uh, uh, we are not yet to get over the colonial aftermath, not at all. Because as I see, there are two benefits. First, it leaves the message of inclusiveness because the world is getting shrunk. And then we need to take care of all the traditions, all the thoughts that which comes from the Middle East, from the China, from India, and all these thoughts uh, to bring inclusion, inclusiveness within philosophy. And second, it helps philosophy as a discipline to get over the hierarchical relation, a tendency that is still lingering on, as I have indicated, how much the West come forward uh, to listen to the other uh, traditions. In this paper, cross-cultural studies planned in the sphere of meaning between Bhartruhari, the grammatical uh, the representative, the darshanika among the uh, grammarians, as yesterday we heard, the three evolution of the grammar school, and of which and some uh, including Professor Mughobadi, I was wondering whether Bhartri Hari indeed has engaged Professor Chakravarti also engaged this uh, issue, whether he is uh, really a philosopher of language at all, or should we brand him 
uh, as uh, a philosopher, but a metaphysician proper, and W.V. Quine, who spoke in favor of a holistic conception of meaning, arguably. It is presumed that this juxtaposition would empower both the traditions, and that is why we undertake this, since both will have something to pick up from the other basket to enrich their own thought. I show this PPT because I'm a fast speaker, and you can uh, run with me. The plan in the paper is somewhat like this, is to present both the cases uh, and their meeting places and their points of depart. At the outset, uh, let's know that for Bhartrihari, the meaning of the sentence is conceived as indivisible. For I'll just pass through because this we have been hearing for past two days. I mean, uh, for past two days. For he conceives the speech unit as one entire cognitive content, which he calls it some width. Indeed, the sentence employs employs an analyzable units within it, the padas and the other units within it. But that meaning emerge, emerges out of the particular concatenation of those units and not because those units are themselves meaningful. The individual words are distinguished only for the purpose of convention or expression, which he brands as uh, Advaitin, an Advaitin of a different variety. He's an Advaitin. He propounds what he calls it Shabda Advaita. So, you know, he uh, demarcates the symptoms or the typical characteristics of all uh, uh, characteristics of an Advaitin, but of a different variety at all. So, he says that this is a conventional exercise that we will come more to that. And these differentiated word meanings, according to him, are the abstracted pieces. We, we produce using imaginative construction or uh, we call, you'll see a lot of Buddhism and a lot of Advaita in uh, uh, Bhartrihari as we move forward. I'll just cite them as well. Now, it is significant to note that Quine, in his word and object, referred to the Indian grammarian as uh, J. Barroso. Um, uh, a reference was already cited here in his 19, 1951 paper. So the present uh, uh, paper explores the viability of drawing a comparison between the two. Now, to, to scratch this at the surface of Quine's holism, he shows that most of our sentences are not justified individually. Almost always, we have heard extensively from Professor Pradhan as well as Professor Chakravarti uh, about the two, uh, the two sides of uh, uh, Quine, both as an epistemologist as as well as a verificationist. So he shows that most of our sentences are not justified individually, almost always. What matters is their relation to some larger chunk of uh, theory. Two features of Quine's approach to meaning are, one is that it is verificationist. See, when you approach Quine, you'll have to keep two things in mind. First, that he's a verificationist, and the second is that He's a holist. Only large theories and not sentences have a meaning. Now, Quine denies uh, meaningfulness to sentences because he thinks they cannot be truly verified. I'll, I'll come to that in detail later, where he applies the principle of verification in a larger uh, framework. He succeeds in that, whether the verification, the, the others in the clan subscribe to what he says is a different question altogether. So unless we place them in this larger body, we cannot confirm meaningfulness to that. That is the claim. However, Quine's holism is at best a confirmation holism, as Professor Pradhan has said. Let's call it a C-holism and not semantic holism proper. For as natural language, languages are empirically and conventionally structured languages, Something that, as Patanjali in Mahabharata says, that just as we go to a potter's house and ask for a potter to be prepared, you don't go to a grammarian and ask for a word because the words are structured in the society. So they are conventionally and empirically structured. So there is no way that we can have a priori structure of language which can bring out the holistic structure of meaning. So in order to propose a proper semantic holism, which is indicated by Professor Pradha, you need to have an a priori structure of uh, language which was uh, which was not in the basket of uh, 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 Quine because he has different agendas. Uh, truly, 
I subscribe fully to what Professor Chakravarti has said that his agenda was not semantic holism at all. Hence, when you juxtapose Quine and uh, Bhartrahari, their differences loom large. They are too obvious to be missed out. And the paper would also sketch Bhartrahari's, and I will rather uh, focus more on that since the other part has already been discussed widely. So I will focus on Bhartrahari's early insights on cognitive linguistics that have opened gateways to contemporary cognitive uh, linguists. Often scholars trace the history of Quinean sea holism from the Fregian semantics and Wittgensteinian grammatical holism, as we just had a discussion whether Wittgenstein I mean, Quine was an extension to Wittgensteinian grammatical holism uh, with Professor Pradhan. So, but Quine is a semanticist of a different genre, as he opposes both Frege and Wittgenstein in many respects. As he say, he was saying that he is a relentless, uh, very few empiricist till the death, and there is a repentance. I see. I was just commenting. There is a repentance in that very statement that I don't repent, that I am an empiricist. So anyway, so though thinkers like Demet have argued that Quine's holistic interpretation of reggae was all based on a mistake, let's keep that aside, Quine remained faithful to his interpretation. At least he was convinced. Uh, at least he was convinced, as we see in his writings in his interpretation and carried forward his semantic thesis in his theory holism and confirmation uh, holism. In fact, his rejection of analytic synthetic distinction itself is based on what he propounded as sea holism. The theory proposes that our statements face the tribunal of sense experience only as a corporate. They don't approach the tribunal individually. No statement, therefore, can be taken in isolation for confirmation at all. A weak reading, you can have a strong reading and a weak reading of C confirmation. A weak reading of it gives the meaning that the verification conditions depends on its surroundings. See, it need not be that each hypothesis should be individually verified. It should be inconsistent with the surroundings. Further, even though verification of each is connected with others, distinct sentences of a theory may have distinct degrees to which various observations confirm them. A strong reading is also possible with that, but that is of a different variety. Testing H, H hypothesis, mean testing H is as contained in T in, in a larger theory that is evaluated as a unit. But given two sentences, and now this is the trouble uh, which has been posed against uh, the Quinean thesis that given two sentences H and H dash in T, there is no observation more relevant to one than to other. So how do we make a distinction? How do we make a choice between H or between H and H dash? Consider a biologist who is devising an experiment to test a hypothesis H. Now, evidently, she has chosen or handpicked this particular hypothesis uh, when compared to, you know, H dash or H1, H2, H3, so on and so forth, she has chosen H. Now, the issue is, why is it that H has been selected at all? If that was arbitrary, then Quine is right. But for it is that the theory laidness, you know, the theory has propped up this particular H uh, hypothesis over the rest H1, H2, H3. We can argue that. On the other, if it was based on observations, then Quine is lost because which it is independent of our theory or our choice. Then the biologist choice reflected objective confirmation, which is uh, not uh, the uh, prescription of uh, Quine. But Quine tries to evade it, saying that when we question a particular hypothesis, say H, we question all its surround. We are not just individually addressing it, but we are questioning it, questioning everything in its surround, so that no hypothesis is tested alone. But can two incompatible hypotheses have the same empirical content as Quine presupposes? Now, Steve Wagner, in a really small uh, paper, he suggests a familiar idea from the philosophy of science to save the, the C confirmation of uh, Quine. He says, in philosophy of science, we have this principle that one observation in the background of different theories 
can count for and against a given hypothesis. That is, when one particular observation has been explained in the background of different theories, can give for and against arguments for a given hypothesis. Probably Quine is uh, uh, looking towards uh, this. This is what Wagner says. And I think this is one way that we can save, uh, seek information of uh, Quine. In brief, the relevance of sensory evidence to yes depends on the position of yes in the surrounding uh, theory. Now, by saying this, like we have, we haven't taken quite much ahead. I grant that, but nevertheless, this seems to be the only way out. Probably, what Quine would like to impress us is that there is what is called the embeddedness. A unit of language, say you, could be embedded in a larger unit in a way that would affect its empirical equivalence with the likewise embedded incompatible U dash, and this embedded as uh, Professor Nirmalia has said, uh, could be as per your use. Or probably we can think of conceiving larger and larger uh, theories or uh, uh, theory relatedness or theory background to which you can think of this embeddedness. Now, the claim is that the verification conditions, even if a theory T, large enough to have empirical content of its own, will still vary with T dash background. Since the empirical content of T can change with the addition of even one single uh, sentence, yes, we will have to distinguish the meaning of T from T plus yes. And this is how the embeddedness and the en enlargedness happen. Recognizing that embedding involves re-identifying statements across changes of a theory, we may say that the verification conditions vary with its theoretical context. And this is how the verification conditions uh, vary according to Quine. From this, we can draw the conclusion that even the best of the verification is would, would deny that individual statements can be verifiable. Hence, see holism seems to be the only way out. Now, let us see how see holism matches with sentence holism in uh, Bharatra Hari's theory of meaning. See, I'm not going to, you know, make one-to-one -one comparison. I will just uh, place both the theories before you. And as such now, the disparities are uh, uh, clear before this uh, community. I'll make it more clear. Now, with regard to the Khanda Baksha and the uh, Khanda Baksha, the two binaries in Indian semantics, beautifully described by Professor Chakravarti in Vakyapadiya chapter 2, he himself says that there are two positions, the uh, sentence uh, holism and sentence uh, uh, atomism. I'm not repeating, you all know by now what is Akhanda Paksha, where, which subscribes to sentence uh, holism. <clears throat> now, there are two main questions as uh, described by uh, Professor Chakravarti. Again, I'm not uh, dealing further with that. What is the sentence? What constitutes the sentence meaning? How is the meaning of a whole sentence cognized by the hearer after the utterance is made? And third, According to sentence holism, sentences are wholes, and they are the unanalyzable units of meaning discourse. Similarly, the meanings of sentences themselves are uh, wholes. Now, we reach words as parts of the sentence, and word meanings as parts of the sentence meaning through analysis. Now, here you have, you get a glimpse of Bhartrihari as uh, an Advaiti through analysis, synthesis, and abstraction. Now, this method is only instrumental in facilitating our language learning, a convenient way of making explicit our implicit linguistic competence. The meaning of a word in isolation is an imaginary construct. In fact, words are as much devoid of meaning as the letters are, just as you don't read or have any meaning of rat in Socrates. So the meaning of a complete sentence is given to us as a whole block of reality. We chip this whole and correlate such abstracted bits and pieces of meaning with words and particles. And this is very pretty uh, like uh, what in the Vyavaharika level we understand the particular objects while, you know, uh, when we speak about the Atma and Atma uh, distinction, when you try to see the particular individual objects and here, you know, there is always uh, all the elements of Advaita present in his uh, Shabda Brahma or Shabda Advaita 
uh, which um, Bhartri Hari proposes. There is the vivarta, there is the uh, raising of the empirical world, and there is also the, the misunderstanding of the particular as the real. A weaker implication may be that in uh, ontological terms, the wholes may have parts, but such parts lose their significance as soon as they lose their contextuality in the whole. So this holistic solution of Bhartri Hari was seriously challenged by Mimam Sagas, particularly the composition, uh, compositionalists uh, uh, like uh, Prabhagaras. Countering the compositionality, in fact, he rejects both the Bhattas and the Prabhagaras. Countering particularly the compositionality theory of uh, meanings, Bhartri Hari argues that a word or sentence is not just a concatenation of different sound units in a particular order. He spoke about uh, Pada Sankhada and Pada Krama, but a single whole, a single symbol which bears a meaning. Here comes the play of consciousness, which I was trying to indicate uh, yesterday uh, to engage a conversation with uh, Madhuji when she was speaking about uh, Davidson's. Uh, principle of charity. And I was trying to tell her that probably Nayaigas are embarrasses, we know that. And when uh, Professor Mukherjee was saying that by the Shaktam, Shaktam Padam we know, that is how uh, the Pada has been. Pada is uh, the single unit of meaning for Nayaigas. But uh, the Shakti, the potency has been identified as Jignasa, the, uh, the interest uh, to know. Now, you know, they cannot speak about, since they are embarrasses, uh, they cannot speak about the play of consciousness. But here, Bhartri Hari has no such constraints because he is a darshanika. So he is, with all vigor, speaks about the play of uh, consciousness. He speaks about the Padaspoda and the Vakispoda, but I'm not getting into the spoda as such that itself is a, uh, a theory independently. He even goes to the extent of saying that words are only abstracted meaning possibilities, whereas the uttered sentence is the realization of a meaning whole, irreducible to those parts in themselves. And friends, uh, you see a lot of one cannot miss, but the influence of both Dinagavanan and uh, the elements of uh, Advaita, you can say that, of course, since Bhartrihari comes prior to Shankara. And we do not know with regard to Bhadri mm, Hari seems to be 6th century AD, and Dindaga seems to have referred to Bhadri Hari. So probably mm, a lot of uh, the Buddhist concept of, I'll show that again, the Buddhist influence is uh, uh, visible here. So where he, they speak about uh, the misconception of uh, raising the world, the world as being constructed by us. So quite like the world construction denoting particulars, the Shabda at the word level is our Vikalpa. Now, this seems to be the message. He even goes to the extent of saying that words are, oh, sorry. No, this doesn't work. Bhadri Hari's metaphysical semantics is, in fact, an offshoot of his metaphysics of Shabda Dvaita or non-dualism of uh, Shabda Brahman. Now, this uh, discussion that has been going on whether uh, Bhartru Hari uh, can be, I mean, what, uh, as a philosopher of language, as a grammarian, what he should have done? He should have, uh, he should have focused on the analysis of empirical language, but then he has moved ahead to doing several other things, and this is uh, uh, not that has been uh, permitted. By analyzing language, by split, splitting it up into words, prefixes, suffixes, etc., we, in fact, he says, misunderstand the fundamental oneness of speech unit. Evidently, he, we see him climbing onto the uh, metaphysical heights, as he says, So, where you have the uh, vivarta being uh, mentioned, I do not have time to speak further on the notion of, in fact, he speaks both on the Parinama as well as Vivarta and uh, in his uh, uh, thesis, but probably during the discussion. So does thought depend on uh, language? This is the crucial question that I want to uh, address. Bhartri here has no doubts, as we all know. He says uh, very famously too, he says, Nasosti Pradeyo Loke, 
yes shabda anugama durude without the uh, word there is no cognition without the operation of the word all knowledge is eliminated by the word now this gives a direct entry for him into cognitive linguistics and i have a strong feeling that the current cognitive linguists have will have a lot to pick up from his uh, basket now we know that linguists in the 20th century was dominated by the structuralist approach to language with its earliest influential representative being sesur uh, and uh, both sesur and chomsky place emphasis on an abstract and idealist idealized linguistic faculty or capacity which they called respectively as la langue and competence now the real presence of a structure being given in advance a priori right, is generally presupposed without explicit argumentation by both of them but this assumption seems to be missing in the indian grammatical tradition now current cognitive linguists like now current uh, linguists like langeka uh, who refer to themselves as construction grammarians and usage based grammarians move significantly from this traditionalist uh, sesur and uh, early chomsky and in fact come closer to bhartrhari they no more focus on the idealized competence of homogenized group of speakers instead they take speakers usage as a point of departure again rather than assuming a given uh, very general structure they emphasize that knowledge of language gets structured in the course of the language use of the speaker now goldberg lists out some uh, seven foundational assumptions of cognitive linguistics and i want to see how far bhartra hari fulfills these seven conditions quickly semantics is based on the speaker's constructs of situations not on objective truth conditions this is their first proclamation second semantics and pragmatics form a continuum and both play a role in linguistic meaning third categorization does not typically involve necessary and sufficient conditions in the old fashion but rather central and extended uh, senses fourth the primary function of language is to convey the meaning then grammar does not involve any transformational component and uh, grammatical constructions are pairings of form and meaning and seven grammar consists consists of a structured inventory of form meaning pairings now according to the first of uh, goldberg's assumption semantics is based on speakers constructs of situations you will see that a student of bhartra hari will have a lot to uh, to speak on this he frequently emphasizes that there is uh, there is uh, he frequently emphasizes that there is a lack of correspondence between the way things are expressed in language and the way the world really is for instance in the third book he says pradeshasya ekadesham va parato va nirupanam viparyayam abhavam va vyavaharo anuvartate at times it approximates pradeshasya ekadesham va parato at times it is altogether a different thing viparyayam opposite all this can happen with regard to uh, uh, the world representation when we try to picture the uh, world again bhartra hari observes that the speakers perceptions and constructs which are at the basis of linguistic utterances do not represent the object as it is he says talavad drishyate voma you see as though that the vyoma the akasha has a flat uh, surface khadyodo habyavadiva taivajasti talam vyomni na khadyodo khudashana neither the uh, neither there exists fire in the five fly nor there is a surface for the sky further even in the same person even the same person may perceive the same thing differently at different times he says ekasmin na vidrushyarde darshanam bhidyade prudhak when i repeatedly see probably i'll have a different uh, perception with regard to one and the same visible thing perception is different for separate seers individually and one and the same person may see the same thing differently in different uh, occasions now this lack of a necessary and direct correspondence gives a certain freedom to the speaker in representing the way in raising the world in constructing the world often the notion of vivaksha the speaker's intention plays a role here interesting passages from vakipadiya says that objects have no intrinsic nature 
it is the use that determines the nature of the object this is being established because the object has all capacities and how you are you see again the buddhas how didaga comes to play significant role in uh, bhartri hari he says lakshanada lakshanada avadishkande padartha natu vastutaha the characteristics don't exist in the object upakarasa evardha kathaschit anugamyade this is exactly what dinaga says upakara it is the way that we use the object that determines the characteristics of the object bhartrihari offers a number of illustrations to show how our perception is often deceptive if you are mayayika uh, like then you you are all in trouble because you are not getting a fine representation of the world for example one sees water in both a river and a marriage but the water in the marriage is not reality and he brings in the alata chakra he is a famous example of all indian uh, scholars where you speak about atyanta mata dhavure nimitte shruti upashraya drishyate alata chakra adau when you quickly uh, turn uh, the fire you see a fire cycle but there is no fire cycle vastuagara uh, nirupana so according to the second assumption of the cognitive linguistics uh i mean uh, yeah cognitive linguistics semantics and pragmatics form a continuum and both play a role in linguistic meaning many illustrations of this point can be found in vakipadiya for instance the example given by the boy uh, it's very famous you all know that kage bhyo rakshadam sarve uh, the butter should be saved from the kage bhyo from the crows but equally implied is that the boy is expected to save preserve the butter from other animals as well though it is not been specifically mentioned in the language similarly the instruction feed him bujya dam one has to feed someone when you say one has to feed someone prachalana sharavana sthalina madhyanam dada anuktam api even that is not been mentioned anuktam api rupena bujya angatvad pratiyate it becomes it forms the parts of bujyanga the part of being feed cleaning the place washing the vessels scrubbing the pots all these seem to form part of feeding even when they are not been uh, referred at all uh then taking into account the speaker's intention in a particular context one sometimes has to decide that the intended meaning of an utterance is quite removed from what is literally stated bhartru hari tells us how fresh meanings are achieved by sentences in different pragmatic context when he says samsargo uprayogascha sahajaryam virodhi that someone was saying that how do you uh, distinguish in the conversation between professor chakravarti how do you interpret a sentence when there is vagueness with regard to a sentence meaning how do you interpret he gives a list where samsargo uprayogascha sahajaryam virodhi da ardha prakarana lingam shabdasya anyasya sannidhi all this and there is another uh, verse also uh, and he gives a series of characteristics which should be taken into consideration connection separation association opposition all these are to be taken into account when you want to give meaning to a sentence contextually the third assumption of the cognitive linguists that the categorization does not typically involve necessary sufficient conditions following the old logic but rather central extended senses now what bhartri had he got to say here this is very famous in him he says he is he is very eloquent on mukhyartha and the gaunartha and of course in sanskrit literature this is very very famous uh, so he says uh, he says shuddhasya ucharane swardham prasiddho asya gamyade where the uh, the ucharana is prasiddha samugya idi vigneyo you should know that this is the mukhyartha ruba madra nibandhana but when it is not prasiddha then what you should do yestu anyasya prayogena yatna diva niyujyade you will have to strain to abstract and extract the meaning tam aprasiddha manyande gaunardha bhi niveshanam so you will have to have demarcate between the mukhyartha and the uh, gaunartha and some of the principles like grammar does not have you know the next three in the uh, set of uh, a priori concepts which cognitive linguists subscribe to uh, bhartri hari do not have much to say on that but uh, 
On the seventh and the last assumption formulated by Goldberg, grammar consists of a structured inventory of form meaning pairings. As noted earlier, Bhardrihari leaves no room for the presence of a structure given beforehand in Sanskrit. On the contrary, he denies the reality of elements that should be central in the supposed structure in uh, language. He says, Brahmana or Dhe Kastit Brahmana Kambale in a in a, in a kambala used by a Brahmin, probably that's what he meant by Brahmana Kambala. Brahmana Ardho Nasti. There is no Brahmana, there is no independent meaning that you may credit uh, to the word uh, Brahmana. As there is nothing, uh, as there is no thing Brahmana in the Brahmana Kambala or Brahmana, uh, Brahman's blanket, like that in the isolated word Devadatta, etc., in the sentence. So you will have to understand the words, the individual words in the context. When you say that Devadatta Gamanaya, you print the cow. Then you will have to place Devadatta in the context of the sentence and credit meaning to that word. Uh, as uh, he says, uh, so is the case with there are other uh, terms also like Vairava, Sishta, Girisha, Tatha, uh, he says, See, the, uh, the meanings are derived somehow by different people according to their pragmatic situations. And he says, Just as uh, you define a path, if uh, when you try to define a path, you try you know, uh, to post the uh, milestones or the citation. So there is a mountain nearby or there is a... Hmm, uh, tree nearby, so on and so forth. Just as you say that there are uh, uh, posts that uh, you would like to uh, cite uh, in while explaining a road by citing trees and hills or mountains like that, the explanation of words such as say Gao is possible by means of different accompanying features like the Gao's Gao can be, you know, the bull or the uh, Gao is going or it is bellowing, so on and so forth, in the context of a sentence. Also, in the understanding of a sentence by language user, there is no definite status of the parts of the sentence. With each individual, he may uh, use uh, different parts. Ardha kadhanjit purushaha kastit se pradivadyade sasrishtava vibhaktava bheda vakya nibandhana. A person understands the meaning in one way or the other, whether combined or separated. Parts are based on the sentences. So, as you have seen, as uh, uh, in the Vakipadiya itself, uh, we have seen the seven categories, uh, the seven uh, prima facie positions of modern cognitive linguists, and we could see at least four uh, of them being heavily subscribed by uh, Bhartrihari in his uh, Vakipadiya, and therefore, uh, and in the Bhartrihari way of uh, Paninian grammar that directly pertain to the basic issues in their research program. So my appeal uh, to all those who work on cognitive linguists here, I learned that there are a couple of youngsters who work on here. It is not that Bhardarahari is all by himself. He is complete. Uh, as a philosopher, we don't need, just as you know, Dhruva Nakshatra doesn't need a torch to be shown. He, it shines by all by itself. So we, we don't have to show its brightness either to the world uh, or to ourselves, but it is fair as, as I have begin, as I began my talk with the inclusiveness uh, of the knowledge traditions to show the world and to strengthen each other tradition. It would be very valuable if we bring the insights of these ancient masters. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your thought-provoking talk with excellent paper. Now we can continue, and at the last part of this session, we can raise question. So now I can invite the next speaker, Professor Jadeshwar Ghosh, to present his paper. Namaskar, respected chairperson of this 
session, Professor Nirmal Nonaran Chakravarti sir, my co-speaker and distinguished resource person, research scholar, teachers and student friends. And I am also addressing those who are present in the online. Uh, my teacher, Professor Konesh Prasad Das, my friend Purbayan Jha is also present in the online platform. So at the outset, I am very much thankful for the organizing committee and the convener of the seminar, Dr. Rajivolochan Behra, and faculties of this department, and also the sponsoring agency, Indian Council of Philosophical Research. Uh, actually, I am sharing, come here to share something and learn many things, keeping this motto. I came here. So my discussion is uh, only three issues. Uh, this is known as the issues of naturalized, denaturalized, and how these two uh, meet in some points. So the issues with uh, Quine and Wittgenstein. So my discussion is on Quine and Wittgenstein's representation of semantics. From the very beginning of the inaugural session, we heard many things about what is language, what is semantics, syntax, and pragmatic. So I am not going very details. And Professor Ramesh Chandra Shah, uh, given naturalized uh, semantics in the morning, uh, we learn many things. So I am not saying very new things, but how naturalized semantics and the issue of naturalized and denaturalized semantics uh, are opposed. Uh, actually, when Quine published epistemology naturalized, that, then the term naturalized is very convenient for us to discuss about it. But we are saying naturalized is semantics. Why it is semantics? Semantics uh, is the study of language, meaning <coughs> Sorry. it is distinguished from syntax or arrangement of words in a sentence. The issues of semantics are central in philosophy of language. Semantics is an unquestionable discussion between localist with holist, truth conditionalist with verificationist, deflectionist with substantivist, direct reference theorist with Hegelians, other factor theorist with two factor theorist, and so on. So it is a long discussion. But what is the consequence? No settlement of these disputes seems to be visible. Quine has raised several questions with regard to meaning in language and in communication. In Quine's uh, philosophy, two areas are related. That is why we are saying that uh, semantics naturalized or naturalized semantics. That is meaning and knowledge. Meaning and knowledge. We are well known that Quine gave a new direction to these two areas, meaning and knowledge. This has been possible because he questioned the existing paradigm and replaced it by a new one, semantics and epistemology thus become two fields that undergone through a radical change due to Quine's alternative mode of philosophizing. For Quine, it is a mode of philosophizing where the traditional concern for meaning and knowledge understood 
in normative terms is replaced by scientific terms. The recasting of semantics and epistemology in scientific terms involves what Quine calls naturalization of meaning and knowledge. Quine's approach to these issues has been that of a thoroughgoing naturalist. He is a very systematic philosopher and his solution to the problem in different areas of philosophy such as ontology, epistemology, philosophy of mind, language are based on his naturalist, naturalistic commitments. Commitments to naturalism is the unifying principle of his philosophy. Naturalism interconnects with the various elements of his philosophy and gives it a fundamental unity. For Quine, there are no hard and fast difference between science and philosophy. As a naturalist, Quine makes two broad claim, claims. First, he claims that there are no first philosophy or that there are no empirical or a priori grounds outside of science upon which science can be justified. He says that science is like a bot which if we are to rebuild it, we must rebuild it plank by plank while staying afloat. Secondly, it is up to science to tell us what there is ontology. And how we know what there is, it is epistemology. Quine maintains that present day science support physicalistic ontology and empiricist epistemology. With the naturalistic framework, Quine claims that meaning is indeterminate, reference is inscrutable, ontology is relative, theories are underdetermined by experience, and the truth value of any statement can be revised. He also makes several bold claims, such as there are no meanings, no propositions, no attributes, no relations, no numbers, no synonymy, no facts, no analytic truths. So all these are the problems. So how to settle the problems in Quine's philosophy uh, so we are trying to each and every moment. So if we ask Quine's semantics naturalism involves rejection with the myth of meaning. Padhanshar is also very nicely present, the myth of meaning. Uh, the myth is that meaning are located somewhere. Some have thought that meaning are in our mind. Some hold that meanings are in the world. And some others have thought that meanings are in a mysterious third realm. Quine rejects all these views. According to Quine, both language both language and meaning are natural facts of men's linguistic behavior that belong to the domain of empirical experience. So in this connection, we can say that the curious way indeterminacy of translation in Quine does not begin by speaking generally about translating 
one language into another. Instead, he considered the special case of translating a theory from one language into another. The aim to understand the totality of sentence of the language and not just the sentences that the native speaker happened to utter. Quine's view is that our travel is from translation to meaning and not from meaning to translation, from translation to meaning, but not meaning to translations. From a naturalistic standpoint, Quine actually embraces, embraces indeterminacy of translation as a substantive doctrine. It spells out the broad outline of what a naturalistic and behavioristic theory of meaning. So it is the approach, it is the problem of Quine's naturalized semantics. Then, um, Wittgenstein, uh, we are well not about his philosophy. Uh, he's unique as a philosopher in so far as he was the maker of two completely different models. This is calculus model and game model. Uh, early Wittgenstein and later Wittgenstein. He inspired three modern schools like logical atomism, logical positivism, and the analytic or natural language movement. In his earlier and later periods, Wittgenstein was committed to exploring the nature and the limits of language and, and of its relationship with reality, and how language presents reality. He expressed that all philosophy is critic of language, and that philosophy is not one of the natural science. The aim of philosophy is to logical clarification of thought. Somehow, he is very much acquainted with a method of the philosophizing method of Socrates. Wittgenstein in his philosophy distinguishes between scientific and non-scientific nature of investigations. He suggested that the latter is correct method of philosophy and identifies it with what is conceptual and grammar. Wittgenstein employs, employs the word grammar and they replace from the old notion of grammar in a, he interpreted in a new way uh, the concept of grammar. Traditionally, grammarians aim to develop those rules of use which invoke to the linguistic from the aspects of grammar. For Wittgenstein, stands in the widest sense the notion of grammar is turned in a very broad sense in Wittgenstein's philosophy. Uh, however, he has never concerned with the structure of grammar in a scientific manner or in a scientific sense. Grammar constitutes only the logical form or essence of the world and not its factual contents. Essence is expressed by grammar. Thus, it is grammar which determines the essence. From a large scale of cases, though not for all, in which we employ the word meaning, the meaning of a word is its use in the language. So his grammatical model is uh, given emphasis on the use of word or activities of language. He 
he offers a distinction between the surface and the depth grammar of language. The depth grammar reveals the logical form of language. The rules which underline language are open to depth grammar. Surface grammar is one that misleads for the reason that it is the one we take at face value. Wittgenstein's depth grammar is not involved with associating a word in a sentence as a subject of the sentence. Instead, it is related to how that word is used in our language. Wittgenstein's natural language, semantics, can be summed up in the dictum. Do not ask for meaning, ask for use, which means that the task of semantics is to settle the problem of meaning by settling the issue of the use of language. The semantics turn from meaning to use for the reason that in use alone, there is the possibility of explaining meaning. In philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein's committed to replacing the picture theory by a toolbox theory of language. Language is an instrument. Wittgenstein links meaning with doing. In rejecting the application of the picture, it can look as if Wittgenstein denies the inner. So these are the two models of naturalized and denaturalized semantics. But uh, in, in very few minutes, uh, I am relating how um, the both models are close with each other. Uh, in the uh, specifically in uh, when we are discussing language then we are discussing about the um, atomistic and the holistic and several forms of uh, meaning so in a, uh, a holistic standpoint we can say that uh, or we can draw they are though they are uh, uh, different uh, differently discuss their opinions regarding language and meaning. But when we are thinking about the holistic sense of meaning, uh, in the holistic framework, uh, generally, there are no com compartmentalization involved in understanding the meaning of language. So holism is often taken to be the idea that whole is more than the sum of the part. So um, we can say that uh, it is fair to claim that Wittgenstein and Quine's holistic uh, tendency prove once again that great mind think alike. Wittgenstein agree with Quine and meaning are not in the head. Meaning is not a matter of private and individual positions. Quine's semantic holism is meant to do justice to the theoretical sphere of science, the con context embeddedness of meaning lies in the intercontextness uh, of meaning of linguistic community with their characteristics and different form of life, especially including their customs and practice. Wittgenstein leaves Quine's company in insisting that it is the social, cultural, and historical context of linguistic expression, which guarantees the determinacy of meaning. Quine was, above all, a constructivist philosopher. He considers his thought as interconnectedness. And he used his life to work out his philosophical vision in the context of language and meaning, we can say that semantics holisms provides a better framework for understanding of meaning. The sensory output is 
disturbed throughout the discourse and show there is no compartmentalization uh, involved in understanding meaning. It helps unify the discourse under the concept of truth and makes truth a prominent concept in the sense that truth alone can provide the basis for a single theory of meaning for the whole language. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your interesting and innovative idea which you engaged in the paper, and it is so knowledgeable. Now, I can request to the audience to put their questions. Yes. Now, I can request to Professor Gopal Sausar to put his question. Uh, I have two questions. One is for uh, the speaker. First question is to Professor uh, Sasikala, ma'am. Uh, uh, ma'am, you have not exactly you have, but in the discuss in your co in the course of your discussion. Question for ma'am. Actually, Francesca. Um, actually, you were talking about the existence of thought without the language. Um, and you were, uh, as per my understanding, you were negating it. So I want to come with the idea that I guess our thoughts exist in our mind always from the beginning, like when we are born. We are like just the other way. Thought is necessarily linguistic. That's that is the idea. But the small children doesn't have the language, no. But I guess even the small children have the thoughts. And I guess even a dumb person <laughs> who not understand the language still have some thoughts in their mind. That is my point. Um, this is uh, to Professor Jadeshwar Ghosh regarding uh, 
uh, uh, the concept of truth. In fact, uh, you began with uh, language and meaning, and uh, at the end, you concluded on truth. So, whether truth is uh, to be naturalized or denaturalized. That um, requires little explanation. Uh, thank you. I would just like to ask a question which is not explicitly addressed by any of the speakers, uh, but I think it's part and parcel of Quine's two dogmas. And I have always found a kind of discomfort with it. I'm not, um, I, I mean, anybody apart from Professor Charishwar, apart from Professor Srikala or, or Professor Chakra, but anybody can if they can help me regarding this confusion, um, that, you know, he says, uh, Quine in uh, Two Dogmas says he has no problems with the identity statements, the analyticity of the identity statements of the form A is A. But uh, he, again, when he goes to the sixth section, he goes on to say that... Repeat uh, what you given He has no problem with? Identity statements of the form A is A. He yeah. has only oh. problems when they are... You know, put into synonymous like synonymous statements like bachelors and unmarried men. Mm -hmm. Then in sixth section, he goes on to say that given the developments of uh, quantum physics, you know, given the kind of intractability of the speed and velocity and momentum of the subatomic particles, and you know, uh, given that kind of intractability of experience, there uh, people are thinking of abandoning uh, the law of identity or the law of excluded middle. And also, you see that A is A. Uh, the tokens are different. A, first token, A, and the second token, A, are different. And if Quine says no, he Quine cannot say that, no, I'm talking about not about the science, but the, but the identity of uh, abstract identity, because then he would be actually going against his uh, empiricist or behavioral standpoint. So can anybody you know, kind of uh, clarify this tension? That's all. Now I demand just two objective questions. Yeah, my question is to Professor Srikla, ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Ma'am, in your presentation, you said that Quine is a verificationist. Uh, am I not if I'm not wrong? You said that it is a verificationist theory. But when I was reading, uh, but when I am reading and when we are reading the two dogmas of empiricism, I think the second section which he is talking about verification is actually against the verificationist theories and if he and he is opting for holism because he's saying that if we adopt verification theory then any type of two incompatible theory can be t taken as true if we are talking if we are taking verification statements in isolation so I think that coin is against verificationist theories rather than becoming a verificationism or be purporting verificationism himself. Uh, is there anybody I can talk later? Okay. So now my question to uh, Professor Nair. Um, whenever we talk about uh, meaning holism, we see that uh, there are three varieties. Mostly people talk about. They will say uh, meaning localism. It's a local holism. We'll say that. Then extreme sense, they say meaning holism means each and everything should be in incorrupted to understand the meaning of a sentence then later part some people say it's a moderate meaning holism people say confirmation meaning holism so where shall we fix the boundary to understand that if this much we need to understand to understand the meaning of a particular sentence uttered by a speaker if the boundary will not be fixed mm -hmm. between the meaning uh, local the local holism moderate holism and uh, i would say corporate or a global holism then one can overlap with each other and therefore meaning will be lost so therefore how shall we fix the boundary and uh, how can the meaning will be communicated if one overlaps with other thank you uh, thank you for that uh, mostly i've gathered questions only on coin to my great surprise, <laughs> though I was focusing all through on Bhardhuri. But never mind, Professor uh, Sahu, about uh, the circularity that is involved in the theory of theory ladiness and uh, uh, under determination. I mean, this is very popular. Like, you know, you're saying that <clears throat> one has to, uh, I mean, each sentence, he as he was not willing to 
subscribe to the verificationism of uh, sentences as he says that uh, the they go to the jury uh, as a corporate he was taking all as uh, professor nirmalia was saying that he was focusing and he was a hardcore verificationist and uh, he was a hardcore empiricist and he has never repented on that and from philosophy of science itself the circularity we have seen not only in coin but also in philosophy of science whoever has spoken about uh, Kuhn and uh, paraban all of them have uh, Faced this, faced this widely, but none of them have discarded this idea because that was so very dear to them. That theory ladenness, neither this could be sacrificed at the cost of other, but then they'll have to survive uh, with that. And I think, you know, he was, uh, Coin was turning a lot towards, there are Coin experts here, I'm, uh, I have read it long, long back. Uh, but uh, I think as Wagner has said that he was looking for solutions uh, uh, for see his see holism was not at all a real theory while and he was looking towards philosophy of science probably for uh, better answers to Francisca uh, she probably was saying he was challenging Bertrand's uh, position that if every uh, thought has to be necessarily linguistic in nature. What about the young children who are unable to put uh, thoughts uh, in the uh, linguistic fashion? In fact, Mimam Sagas discuss about you know how linguistic abilities are attained uh, by uh, children. I do not know whether Bhadri Hari. Bhadri Hari is a philosopher. You should understand him in that fashion. He is a philosopher, uh, and he has. I mean, it is, see, if you are a cognitive linguist of a variety in which you are trying to understand how language is generated in an individual, probably Bhadrihari might not help you much. But nevertheless, if you want to see the, the ontological inputs, how Sputa as a, as a, uh, as a um, flash, the meaning comes out. Uh, and you will have great tools that you can pick up from uh, Bhartri Hari. I think I have answered your question. Like, you know, it is one thing to ask how linguistic abilities are generated in a child, where probably compositionality principle might help you. See, for instance, me, Mam Saka say that how a child understands the language. He says, Ga manaya, Ashwa manaya. Two things he's watching, and then he understood the meaning of anaya. Because there are two things that, that have been brought. This is how the language has been generated, right? No, I'm talking about how the language has been generated. About You're talking about how the children who do not have the linguistic abilities. So the, the, how the language has been generated has been assessed in Indian philosophy by a different group of uh, people. But here Bhatri Hari has certain philosophical uh, concerns which he takes it up. So if you are, a, if you belong to a different genre of cognitive linguistics, then you will have, of course, it's a very relevant question because part or a lot of cognitive linguists do, like particularly the earlier uh, cognitive linguists, starting with Chomsky, were uh, concerned uh, with how, how the language language has been generated in the individual. So that is indeed an uh, empirical question that cognitive linguists of contemporary times do address. But then you do not have much to pick up from this basket. Uh, now, how identity uh, uh, statements like A is A, how language, how logic gets sacrificed at the uh, cost of uh, verificationism? How logic is gets logic gets sacrificed at his empiricism? Yeah, that's that's visible. That's visible. Why? 
I, I did not know properly as he says that he is a committed emperor of Santa verification. Is that that? Please, please. I am coming to uh, Professor Gopal uh, house. Uh, okay, okay, madam, continue. Do you want to respond to her? Ah, you can. Oh, yeah, you continually, I want to take her one by one. Okay. All right. So this, there are just uh, two more questions. A uh, young friend has asked how I mean, Quine is not a verification. In fact, he has widened the horizon of uh, verification also and he was a hard food as we since morning you have been hearing this how he is committed at the cost of delimiting his philosophy itself but that that's what i was saying that probably he would have repented though when he says that there is no repentance there indeed is a kind of a repentance in what he has said but he was widening widening his uh, vistas of uh, uh, verificationism. To the beautiful question to what uh, uh, Dr. Satya has asked about the three types of sentence, uh, holism, where you draw the boundary. I do not know, but uh, I can just say, tell you that uh, Bhartrihari's intentions are, of course, he is trying to, as the cognitive linguist, are trying to say that he is trying to open up language and to take the inputs of pragmatic insights. That part is always there. But he wants to do more than that. That is what I think. Probably, you know, I say it with I say it with a metaphysical spectacle, and that is why I see a global holism, as you were trying to say, is what he seems seems to be have in mind, where he is trying to unashamedly he is no despite he brands himself as a grammarian that is what very often he's been criticized that he's not doing his job he's doing someone else's job but nevertheless he seems to he has his agenda of doing this uh, and i strongly feel that he doesn't feel like drawing the uh, boundaries though we think that as grammarian he should have drawn the boundaries Actually, uh, my uh, discussion is on uh, naturalized and denaturalized. So when we are uttering naturalized in Quine philosophy, it is no problem. But when we are discussing about Wittgenstein's philosophy and claiming it, it is denaturalized, it is maybe problematic. It, it is a interpretation. But what is the model of uh, their analysis? When we are discussing Quine's model of discussion, a, a, it is uh, quite naturalized. That means to theorizing, to uh, uh, in a scientific spirit, 
but in um, uh, Wittgenstein's philosophy, it is uh, don't think, but look. Uh, so uh, if we uh, think in a, a normative sense, uh, then the naturalization of semantics, which uh, automatically destroy its uh, normativeness. Uh, that's why we are keeping the model of Wittgenstein's. The Wittgenstein's model is a very uh, uh, free and radical moment. Uh, this moment is very much stressing on the activities of language. So it's a new model. Uh, and uh, Quine's interpretation is uh, known as the model is uh, uh, within the naturalistic framework, we can construct a theory. Without a theory, there is no meaning. So theory is uh, uh, given priority by Quine. But Wittgenstein's is uh, not uh, 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 showing any theorization, but it is oh, he's given the emphasis, the meaning uh, is it's used in the method. It's a, it's a huge method. It's a activities. It is a tool in the toolbox. All sorts of things are when we are discussing, when we are thinking, then at that time, uh, we are saying that it is uh, known as uh, uh, denaturalization of semantics. And then um, uh, Professor Ponda's uh, questions is uh, and that uh, regarding truth. Uh, Quine is also uh, not worried about truth, but Quine is worried about evidence, about observation sentence, uh, and uh, the framework of meaning. And Wittgenstein is not uh, about worried about truth, but the, uh, his truth is how to use a, a truth in a language. Uh, this is the sufficient uh, model uh, to in order to. Uh, overcome the misunderstanding, abusement, and puzzlement. Uh, that is why uh, to shoo the fly way out of the fly bottle. Uh, so this is the aim of philosophy. So this is uh, uh, known as uh, the truth of both of them. And therefore, I mean, a concluding point, I am saying that uh, the word truth, it is a truth for both of them, that they are, uh, we can say that they are meeting in a same position. But um, actually, I am failed to understand uh, properly in a key these questions. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, I think you know, yes, there will be lots of such you know, questions, queries, conclusions, and we as philosophers have to learn how to live with it. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, uh, the blood, blood pressure of the organizers is going up, I can see. So we don't want them to fall sick. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, with this happy note, uh, we have to end this session here. Uh, I don't really have uh, much to add, except uh, conveying my sincere thanks to both the, uh, the speakers for uh, their presentations. Both the presentations actually, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 throw new uh, questions, new queries, new uh, models of analysis on Quine, Bhartri, etc. I especially really enjoyed um, uh, uh, listening to uh, uh, Professor Naya's attempt to locate uh, Bhartri Hari as uh, a cognitive linguist. I think this is something you know, that, that one should uh, work on in greater detail. Uh, what are the you know, possibilities and what are the differences, even from the differences, new points could be marked. So, so uh, thank you very much and thank you all for, for being with us, for the questions and of also for silent participation. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Yes, now I can, uh, we have the last, ses last speaker in this session. So, uh, yes, now you can leave your seat. I can request to Professor Shekhar Nair, ma'am, to sit here to present the session. Yes. We can wait for just uh, 20 minutes. Please, I can request my humble request to all of the audiences to keep patience because, as you know, that the weather is killing our time. It's already killed sometimes. I don't know what will happen. Just one speaker. Yes.
Now I can request to the Honorable Speaker, Professor Gopavant Mishra, sir, who is the former head of the Department of Sanskrit, Faculty of Arts, Banaras Hindu University, ex-Vice Chancellor of Sri Somanath Sanskrit University, Gujarat, ex-Visiting Professor of Sanskrit, Swaran Nawabhule. Could you please have a seat on the dais? Now I can request to our scholars to scholar to ready the things. Then. I can request to Professor Inaki Mam to felicitate Professor Sekanyar Mam with a memento. Mam, could you please? My request to Professor Ellen Chakravarti sir to felicitate Gopavant, Professor Gopavant, Mr. Sir with the memento, Sal and Garland. Yes, Ellen Chakravarti sir, please. As you know that Sari is so renounced already ex essence law of the Sanskrit University, Somanath Gujarat. So I would like to request the speaker to present his paper now. Vagartha vivasam pripto, Vagartha pratipattaye, Jagata pitaro vande, Parvati parameshwaro, Sri Guru Pyo Namaha. Paramadharaniyaha, Asya Satrasya Sabhadhyaksha Mahodayaha, Professor Sri Kala Mahodayaha, Samupastitaha, Professor Godavari Samishra Mahodayaha, Professor Takravarti Mahodayaha, Annecha Vishishta Vidvansaha, Chodhartinaha, Samagatahati Thayaha. Mama Manne, Mama Madhya Bhasa Sanskritam Chet Kachinyam Nasyat. Kim? Kastu. Dithiyam, Sanskrite Subhashita Masti Ubhukshitaihi Vyakaranam Na Bhujyate. Yada Ubhuksha Agachati Tatrakuna Vyakaranam Buddhau Na Pravishati. Tatha Kincha Itaha Prak Tatha Vidha Darsanika Chintanam Shruttva 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 Buddhihi Idanim Tatastha Jata Asyat. Atahan Kincha Navinam Kimapi Maya Bhaktum Na Ipi Ishyate Jat Bhavantha Jananti Acharya Bhartri Harehe Jan Matam Tasya Matasya Pakshatrayam Kevalam Upasthapya Aham Bidami Shyami Prathamaha Pakshaha 
यत मंगलाचरणे महाकवि कालिदास महाकवे श्लोक मैं उच्चारित वागर्थ संतृप्त वागर्थ प्रतिपत्त जगत पितर पार्वती परमेश्वर तयो संबंध परिकल्पना अवसरे महाकवि कालिदास वागर्थयो शब्दार्थयो यादृशा संबंध तादृशा संबंध पार्वती परमेश्वर अस्ती सह वदति एषा परिकल्पना महाकवे कालिदास न भारतीय मनीषाया परिकल्पना शब्द अर्थ अतिरिच्य कदा स्थात न शक्नोति उभयो संबंध कीदृश नाम अर्धनारीश्वरवत् संबंध पार्वती परमेश्वर संबंध तादृश संपृक्तता एषा विमर्श उत्पूर्वकाले उत्तर काले विशिष्टतया व्याकरण परंपरायां तत्र च आचार्य भर्तृहरे दार्शनिक व्यवस्थायां अतीव स्पष्टतया समुद्घाटिता अस्ति तत्र प्रथम पक्ष नाम एषः शब्द अथवा अर्थ शब्द अर्थ संबंध परिकल्पनाया प्राक एतदुच्यते यथा महोदय या गतसत्रे उत्तम न स्वस्ति प्रत्यो लोके यदानुगमादृते अनुविधमिव सर्व ज्ञान सर्व शब्द न भाषते किमी परिकल्पन चिंत महामना मदन मोहन मालवीय एक रूप से परिकल्पना एक विश्वविद्यालय से परिकल्पना गत से परिकल्पना मंदिर से परिकल्पना अदृष्ट से परिकल्पना दृष्ट से परिकल्पना किमी परिकल्पना नाम प्रत्यय कोई प्रत्यय बोध अवगमन प्रतिपत्ति उपपत्ति शब्द विहाय नव प्रवर्तते एकदृश बोध आद संस्थाप्य प्रथम कांडे आचार्य भर्तृहरिण बोध एक अवगमन स्थापित प्रथम पक्ष संबंध परिकल्पनाया प्राक प्रथम पक्ष एक विषय कथम पुनः शब्द उच्चार्य तदय आचार्य पाणिनी स्वपाणीय शिक्षाया वदति आत्मा कथम संबंध विवक्ष आगछति आत्मा बुद्धिया समेतिया मनो युक्ते विवक्षया विवक्ष विवक्ष कारण आत्मा मन आत्मा बुद्धिया आत्मान संयोज्य विवक्षया मन प्रयोग प्रयोग प्रयोजयति तत्र कह आशय नाम आत्मा बुद्धिया समेत अर्थ संसारे जावंत अर्थ सी अर्थ स्थूल सूक्ष्म जे जो कभी विषय नाम सह अर्थ पदेन वाच्य चिंत बुद्धि आत्मा लज्जा भय क्रोध एक एक प्रारूप क्यों गजस्य अस्ति गजः अश्व मंदिर तत्पमस्ती संसारे परिचय दिन नाम रूपे व्याकरवाणी नाम रूपेण च मम रूपम किंच मम नाम भी अस्ति तद्वत् जस्य रूपम अस्ति तत्म्यक गजस्य रूपम अस्ति अश्वस्य रूपम अस्ति किंतु लज्जाया भयस्य क्रोधस्य आत्मन रूपम नास्ति चेदपि नाम अस्ति तेन अस्माक परिचय 
अर्थात कश्चिद भी प्रत्यय तस्य उपस्थापनाय कृते किं करोति आत्मा बुद्ध्या अर्थान तादृशमर्थं विनिवेश्य अभिनिवेश्य ताद बुद्ध्या मनः योजयति अनन्तरं मनः कायाग्नि माहन्ति स प्रेरयति मारुतं मारुतस्तूरसी स्मरण मन्द्रं जनयते स्वरम इति काचित् प्रक्रिया शब्द जनन प्रक्रिया उच्यते एषः एकः पक्षः जावन्तः सर्वे स्रोतार क्रमशः बहिर्गत्सेयुः तावत् अहं परिसमाप्तिं करिष्यामि तथा दृश्यमस्ति इदानीं भोजनकालः अतः एतत् सर्वं व्याकरणं बुद्धौ तथा वा प्रविशेत भाषा तत्र बाधिका न स्यात् कदाचित् संस्कृतेन न भोगभुक्षा कारणं स्यात् संस्कृत भाषणं संस्कृत भाषा इति न तर्हि द्वितीयः द्वितीयः पक्षः नाम जथा द्वितीयः पक्षः त्रय पक्ष एकः पक्षः एकः विषयः आचार्य भत्रेण उक्तः अर्थात् ए कोपि विषयः कोपि अर्थः संसारे शब्दं विना न प्रवर्तते इति प्रथमः पक्षः द्वितीयः पक्षः इन्द्रियाणां स्वविषयेषु अनादिर योग्यता यथा अनादि अर्थे शब्दानां सम्बन्धो योग्यता तथा शब्दानां योग्यता शक्ति ही क्षमता शब्दे तादृशी योग्यता क्षमता शक्ति अस्ति यथा इन्द्रियेण चक्षुरिन्द्रियेण दृश्यते तत्र इन्द्रियेण श्रूयते स्पर्श इन्द्रियेण स्पर्शः क्रियते इन्द्रिय द्वारा अपि अस्माकं ज्ञानं भवति एतः एषः घटः एषः पटः इति ज्ञानं भवति इन्द्रिय द्वारा तद्वत् शब्द द्वारा अपि ज्ञानं भवति तर्हि इन्द्रिय द्वारा चक्षुरादि ज्ञानेन्द्रिय द्वारा ज्ञानं भवति अयं घटः अयं पटः इत्यादि तद्वत् शब्द द्वारा अपि अयं घटः अयं पटः इति बोधः भवति अनयो कः भेदः तादृश भेद विषये स्पष्टतया उक्तम अस्ति यद्यपि उभय यथा इन्द्रियाणां अर्थग्रहणे शक्तिः अस्ति चक्षुरादि इन्द्रियाणां तद्वत् शब्दानाम अपि योग्यता अस्ति अर्थसंग्रहणे विषय अवगमनार्थं शब्दानां शक्तिः अस्ति तर्हि कः भेदः उभयो भेदः नाम इन्द्रियाणि अर्थग्रहण विषये ज्ञान संपादन विषये साधन रूपाणि भवन्ति तथा चक्षुः नेत्राभ्यां दृश्यते घटः घटज्ञाने नेत्रयोः प्रवेशः नास्ति घटः अस्ति अग्निः पर्वतो वहनिमान धूमवत्वात् पर्वतस्य ज्ञानं पर्वते पर्वत पर्वते अग्निः ज्ञानं अग्निः सत्ता अग्निः एषः पर्वतः वहनिमान तादृशः बोधः ज्ञानं जातं चेत् तत्र धूमः न प्रविशति अर्थात् तत्र एषः एषः हेतुः अर्थात् एतद् इन्द्रियं न प्रविशति किन्तु अग्नि घट घट इति एतादृश अर्थ अवगमने शब्दः प्रविशति शब्देन तदा अर्थः अवगम्यते तदा शब्दोपि भासते अर्थे शब्दस्य प्रवेशः भवति शब्दं परित्यज्य अर्थः न भवति किमपि अग्निः घटः पटः घटस्य बोधः चक्षुरिन्द्रियेण भवति किन्तु चक्षुरिन्द्रियं तस्मिन् घटस्वरूपे न प्रविशति किन्तु घट घटमानय घटं पश्यामि तादृश अवगमने एषः शब्दः अपि नितरां तिष्ठति अर्थात् अर्थेन सह शब्दस्यापि अवगमनं भवति एषः द्वितीयः पक्षः आचार्य भत्रिहरेण कथितः तृतीयः पक्षः एतावत् उक्तः अहं विरमिष्यामि तृतीयः पक्षः नाम शब्दस्य सत्ता द्वयम् एकम् एकम् भवति मुख्य सत्ता एका भवति गौण सत्ता यथा घटः कथम् आनय घटः अस्ति आनय पुष्पं पत्रम् अस्ति पर्णम् अस्ति स्वृशामि पर्णः पर्णम् स्वृशामि पुष्पं स्वृशामि पुष्पम् अस्ति पुष्पं एषा सत्ता एषा अर्थः पुष्पेन सह तस्य नित्य सम्बन्धः वैयाकरणे हि मन्यते सिद्धे शब्दार्थ सम्बन्धे लोकतः अर्थ प्रयुक्ते शब्देन धर्म नियमः एकं वैशिष्ट्यं वैयाकरणानां शब्देन अपि ज्ञानं भविष्यति अपशब्देन अपि भविष्यति सर्पः एतेन अपि बोधः सांप एतेन अपि बोधः बोधः तु भविष्यति समानरूपेण 
कसि सर्प वदति समान कसि सांप वदति समान अग्नि अग्नि से भी बोध होगा आग से भी होगा अग्नि से होगा ऐसा नहीं है व्याकरण नहीं मानते हैं आग से होगा भेद कुत्र अग्नि शब्द न धर्म भवत शब्द से प्रयोग धर्म हाँ अपशब्द से प्रयोग धर्म न्यून भवत अतः भारतीय वैयाकरण वैशिष्यम शब्द अभी एक शब्द सम्यक ज्ञाता सुष्ठु प्रयुक्त स्वर्गे लोके काम धुर्भवती अर्थात धर्म निम करणीय चेत शब्द उच्चारण मेण धर्म उत्पद्य है अपशब्द उच्चारण न धर्म न्यूनता गति अतः धर्मेण सह शब्द प्रयोग से जहा अन्वय केवल भारतीय वैयाकरण ही दर्शि अस्त महा महाभाष्यकारेण स्पष्ट मुक्तमस्ति शस्त्रेण धर्म निम व्याकरण शास्त्र केवल धर्म निम करोतिषु शब्द प्रयोक्त अपशब्द न प्रयोक्त किसी ने कहा आप जानते हैं प्रदूषण की पर्यावरण की बात आप करते हैं भूमि भूमि प्रदूषण जल प्रदूषण आकाश भी प्रदूषित होता है आकाश गुण शब्द यदा शब्द वदा तरी आकाश शुद्ध भवती अपशब्द वदा आकाश अभी प्रदूषित प्रदूषित भवती वह न जानी आकाश प्रदूषण विषय चर्चा न कुर्म केवल भूमि प्रदूषण जल प्रदूषण वायु प्रदूषण आकाश प्रदूषण अपशब्द प्रयोग द्वारा आकाश अभी प्रदूषित भवती कारण वैयाकरण ही उत्तमस्त शब्द से प्रयोग धर्म अपशब्द से प्रयोग अधर्म न उच्य है कि शब्द से प्रयोग धर्म अतः एषा एष बोध केवल भारतीय मनीषाया साधि अंतिम पक्ष उच्यम आसी शब्द से सप्ता दुम एक मुख्य सत्ता पुष्प कथन पुष्प से बोध द्वितीय गौण सत्ता उपचार सत्ता जहा प्रसंग आगत शृंगम नंध्यापुत्र नस्तव तादृश अर्थ से अवगमने कथम व शब्द भवि अर्थ सामर्थ यदि अर्थन सह शब्द से नित्य संबंध तरी जहा अर्थ नस्तव बंध्या पुत्र नास्ति बंध्या पुत्र एतेन शब्द जहा बोध भवति कथम भवि तदिषे आचार्य वदति व्यपदेशी पदार्थ अन्या सत्ता औपचारिकी सा सत्ता औपचारिकी सत्ता भवति अर्थात सर्वांगवस्थासु सर्वेशम आत्म रूप से दर्शिका आचार्य भर्तृहरि बौद्धम अर्थ निश्चिनोति अर्थ बौद्ध बुद्धिस्था बुद्ध बंध्यापुत्र सशसृंगम भी आकाश पुष्पम भी सर्वी औपचार शब्द से औपचारिक सत्ता द्वारा संभाव्य तादृश बोधम जनयत पक्ष संक्षेपेण मैं उपस्थित विद्वांस सी मम कि वक्तव्य नास्तीश जैन महोदय अस्त तस्व विषय मम कि ज्ञान भी नास्ति केवल वैयाकरण कतिपय पक्ष एक जन बाल बुद्धिया जी ज्ञात अस्तम पुरा मैं निवेदित किंच मैं चिंतित आंग्ल भाषा प्रवर्तते संस्कृत भाषा भी प्रवर्तता कारण संस्कृत भाषा मैं विषय उपस्थित सर्वे जे उपस्थित ते महता धर्जेण श्रुतवंत जे गुवा आनंद संस्कृत शब्द श्रुवा गतवंत है तेजा भी धर्म पुण्य सैदेव अत एवत उत्तर विरमा धन्यवाद Thank you so much, sir. Really, it is so so thought-provoking and very excellent paper. Now, I would like to, I would request to our chairperson to present the session. Thank you, sir. Hey, you speak. You yourself spoke about uh, the significance of speaking the using the shabda. knowing the uh, dharma which indeed you showed uh, in your representation initially he said about you know the first thing that uh, bhartrihari underscores that without language no pratyaya can be established and then <clears throat> he promised that he will just speak about the three functions and then he spoke about uh, the two types of uh, the shabda janana prakriya and then he spoke about um, how we can know 
with both the indriyas as well as uh, uh, the shabda and finally he spoke about the mukhya and the uh, gauna and beautiful indeed was that when you spoke about the akasha pradesh pradushita when the akasha gets pradushita with uh, the wrong usage the using shabda without knowing its uh, dharma indeed we are blessed professor and um, we should hear you more probably uh, the department will make uh, occasions to have your full presentations on some other time these are the presentations in fact the young uh, should uh, hear and the sanskritam was very very beautiful thank you very much and is there any question i i suppose uh, no i think uh, I, i can request to the audience to uh, your question in the yes i in the long time we can discuss there so now i can request to all the audience to have their lawns i am extremely sorry for this